Since Spyro the Dragon's debut on the PlayStation in 1998, he and Crash Bandicoot have always been tied at the hip. Like this monstrosity. Crash and Spyro in the late 1990s were like the PlayStation's unofficial mascots, always drawing comparisons from one another for being not just their brand's top two platformers, but arguably the two best platformers in their market entirely. So if I make a lot of comparisons between them during this video, now you know why. So our story begins in Artisans of the Dragon Realm, where two elder dragons are being interviewed to... Tell us about the Dragon Realm, I guess. And one of them starts some first grade level smack talking of Nasty Nork. With G's. The Nasty the Nork. Uh -huh. Nonetheless, Nasty Nork, or Ugly F*** <laughs> is our villain. The story here is... simple, to put it nicely. Nasty Nork is a simple creature. Simple. He has been contained in a remote world and is no threat to the Dragon Kingdom. No threat! Besides, he is ugly. ugly. Spyro finds this mildly inconvenient. Looks like I got some things to do. What a con Spyro being only slightly annoyed by the fact that his friends could be imprisoned in crystal for the rest of eternity if he doesn't do anything about it is made hilariously more irritating by the fact that he sounds like he has a wooden clothespin over his nose whenever he talks. Afraid? Of what? I'll tell you what I'm afraid of, Spyro. I'm afraid you've come down with swine floor. Nonetheless, we're off on our adventure to collect gems and rescue our friend. Oh, Jesus, Spyro, stop doing donuts. This isn't a Walmart parking lot. Going from Crash's snappy turning on a whim in any direction you wish to this long loop is weird. Despite that turbulence. Get it? Because he's a dragon. <laughs> Spyro is a gem to play as. Spyro can jump, glide, charge, supercharge. Breathe fire and roll. Wait. Roll? Uh, yeah, roll apparently, because that's really fucking helpful in this game. Anyway, on we go into Stone Hill, and oh, that's cute. Spyro looks like a little dog ready to go into the tub. In all seriousness, the loading screens are actually pretty cool, considering how seamless they are, and definitely much more interesting than. This is basically how the game progresses from here. You travel through the six hub worlds of the Dragon Realm, hopping in and out from portal to portal, collecting treasure and rescuing our dragon friends. I think. I don't know. Spyro doesn't seem to care much. The levels are very vibrant, colorful, lively, and overall just a pleasure to run around in. Oh god, the egg thieves. I forgot to mention them. Okay, I haven't played Spyro in over a decade, but I still remember how terrible these little shits were to catch. Oh. Never mind. And that will become a recurring theme in Spyro the Dragon. While Crash 1 could ramp up pretty high in difficulty, Spyro for the most part is embarrassingly easy. The bosses are terrible. Literally worse than any of the Crash 1 bosses. As bad as guys like Papu Papu and Pinstripe were, at least they tried to hit me. Even ugly f the final boss of the game runs away from you, hardly even trying to hurt you. You turned 80 dragons into stone twice. Why are you terrified of what? Spyro 1 does have its challenging moments though, as some of the egg thieves can actually be pretty tricky to catch. I know a lot of people hate these guys because of that, but I actually find it kind of fun running around after them a couple times before figuring out their route and finally catching them. There's also these flying levels where you have to complete multiple objectives such as flying through gates, hoops, bashing treasure chests, and committing aerial homicide under an allotted time. These can be tricky and even a bit enraging. They're the only part of the game I actually had a bit of trouble with, and it works as a nice pace breaker considering how tedious it can be at times exploring the standard levels if you're aiming for 100% completion. Considering mainly what keeps the gameplay interesting is the combat. Some enemies can only be flamed, charged, and some are even totally invincible until Spyro gets a kiss and becomes HOLY! There's tons of other ways to approach enemies as the game progresses, but we don't have time to talk about that because we gotta get on with the gem collecting. And you'll need all the time you can get because some of these gems are very well hidden. Not to the extent that you'd find their hiding spots unfair though. In fact, you'd feel like an absolute brainiac when you find these hidden pathways. So you freed all the dragons, collected all the gems, and you've gotten all the eggs back. And the 100% reward you get for that is actually pretty cool, even though up to this point I'd seen enough gems for a lifetime. Ugly f**k's bonus loot level is very satisfying considering the insane amount of treasure you collect. And you get a cutscene after of dragons playing basketball with a sheep. Woohoo! Animal 
reviewed. Speaking of the dragons, each of the 80 dragons you rescue has unique lines recorded for them. Run! Run! Okay, a few of them repeat themselves. Thank you for releasing me. Thank you for releasing me. Thank you for releasing me. I've shit my back. But this is still all very impressive and oddly charming, even if they do say some very obvious stuff here and there. Here's a hint. Metal armor is fireproof, but a charge attack will take care of them. That's not even a hint. That's just a cheat sheet, you f***ing numbskull. And who could forget the most infamous line of all? Spyro, it's great to see you, but I've got to go. Go do what, Cletus? Ten to your floor? Suck my dragon dick! While Crash Bandicoot was going for a 3D experience, it was still mounted to a fixed camera, whereas Spyro goes all the way with a camera you control in a free-roaming environment which can help make the levels feel much more open and engaging, creating the sense of going on a proper adventure rather than being on a fixed path. You're free to explore the worlds in whatever way you please and to play them in whatever order you want, although good luck to you because some of these levels run slower than Gary in snail games. Accompanying the levels is a pretty good soundtrack from the drummer of the police. I wouldn't say the soundtrack as a whole is as strong as Crash 1's, considering a lot of the tracks honestly just blend together and sound the same to me. Many of the tracks themselves are great, don't get me wrong, but they just get repetitive listening to in quick succession. In isolation, they're fantastic, and there's definitely a few bangers. When I started playing Spyro, I'll be honest, I was pretty put off by the iffy controls and the shitty bosses that gave me crash PTSD. But looking past all that, Spyro at its core is a fantastic, free-roaming, fire-breathing, world-hopping platformer that set the gaming world on fire, and rightfully so, only to have the ferocity of that fire quenched by questionable controls, a repetitive soundtrack, so many gems to collect that it honestly becomes a chore to 100%, and without a doubt, the worst bosses I have ever played against. On the bright side, of course, Spyro has loads and loads of untapped potential, so I'm excited to see what adjustments were made to take the sick boy to new heights. As Spyro said, I'd say the sky's the limit. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. The crash review, I'll be honest, did a lot better than I thought it would. I expected like six views on that thing, so... Thank you to all of you who gave me a chance, and I hope this video is even better. Tune in next time for my review of Crash Bandicoot 2, and please be sure if you haven't seen it yet, go check out my Crash 1 review. See you then! Smash them, Spyro! Stamp them out and squish them and squash them! <laughs> uh-huh.